excitement and anxiety build as the Nigerian election enters its final phase. We'll take a closer look at the candidates' campaigns. Nigerians in the United States share their thoughts on the critical election. And will you be able to print your pills someday? A team of British researchers says yes. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening, I'm Esther Gidu. You are in for Vincent Makori. This is Africa 54. The excitement and concern builds with Nigeria's critical presidential election just days away. The top two candidates running in Saturday's presidential poll are both familiar faces. It is the fifth election campaign for incumbent Muhammadu Buhari, 76, who was a military ruler in the 1980s, and the fourth campaign for main opposition candidate Atiku Abubakar, 72, who was Nigeria's vice president from 1999 to 2007. Political observers say the race for the nation's top post is tight. VOA's Anita Powell has more on the candidates from Johannesburg. Two political heavyweights, both former leaders in their 70s, are vying for the top office in Africa's largest economy, Nigeria. 76-year-old incumbent President Muhammadu Buhari swept power in 2015 on promises to improve Nigeria's security, oil-dependent economy, and reputation for rampant corruption. His opponent, 72-year-old former vice president and businessman Atik Abu Bakar, is campaigning on a similar platform. These two frontrunners in the election race have um, been in politics for, for decades. This is not their first time either for, um, for running for president. Uh, between them, they've nearly run for the presidency ten times. Both men have stressed the need for greater security in the fight against Islamist militants in the north and economic diversity away from Nigeria's dependence on oil. While their words on the other crucial issue, corruption, are similar, their reputations differ. Buhari made clean governance his signature issue, but in an interview with VOA, he agreed with critics that corruption has not been wiped out. Yes, there will always be people who will be preferred to offer bribes. And, um, but what we feel is just like the military operation. Whoever is caught accepting bribes you know, will uh, incite the lady in dealt with. For his part, Abu Bakar, known as Atiku to his followers, is dogged by corruption allegations, which he quickly denied in an interview with VOA. He said he plans to take a hardline approach on corruption as well. You just have to strengthen your laws and also strengthen your processes to make sure that people don't escape and also make sure that people who are accused of corruption, you know, uh, you know, tried in a very, very fast manner, so that you don't allow, I certainly will not agree or allow a situation where corrupt uh, trials last for several years. While some analysts predict a tight presidential race, it could come down to demographics and identity politics. But voters should also be looking at Buhari's well-publicized health problems, says Parker. Buhari's health is a huge factor. Um, it's a hu huge source of concern um, for a lot of people, you know, investing in Nigeria in terms of, you know, is he going to be able to complete his term? What does that mean for the political stability? We know that Bahari will, will um, if he has to, will hand over to his deputy. And his deputy is actually a very dynamic, business-friendly, young um, guy with, who's got quite a lot of um, national appeal. He's been able to broker peace in the rest of, in the rest of Niger Delta region. Um, so he does have that draw. Um, and again, that's, that, those sort of individuals in his government are, are quite exciting to watch. But that decision is up to Nigerians, who will vote on February 16th. Anita Powell, VOA News, Johannesburg. And joining me now on the phone from Lagos, Nigeria, is VOA's reporter, Peter Clotty. Good evening, Peter. Good evening, Esther. Now, Peter, the stakes are high. The race is very tight. And we just learned that uh, today the presidential candidates have signed a peace accord. What does the peace accord entail? Well, this is the second time that all the presidential candidates signed a peace deal. 
it is a commitment mm -hmm. that they would ensure and encourage their supporters not to engage in act of violence or intimidation, which the security operatives have said they will clamp down on during and after the elections. Mm -hmm. Because some of the concerns are that the ruling party, or the government for that matter, is using state institutions and thugs to intimidate and harass the opponents. Officials of the government say that is not true and that it is unlikely for them to use thugs and the security operatives mm -hmm. to undermine the peace and security of the country, so, uh, so to attack people just for the sake of elections. So Peter, uh -huh. this peace accord was yeah. meant uh -huh. to ensure that everybody is on a level playing field and that there's no violence. Uh, Peter, there are also some uh, candidates who are alleging there might be foreign interference. What are you hearing from the ground? Well, even ruling party officials warned that Nigerians should be left alone to choose their own leaders and that uh, reporters or poll observers or whoever they are could come in observe or monitor the election, write their reports, and leave Nigerians to practice their own democracy. This has come from uh, Asiwa Jubola Tinubu, the national chairman of the All Progressive Congress, the ruling party. Uh, when I spoke with the Oba of Lagos, who is the king of Lagos, he reiterated the same thing, that Nigerians should not be coerced, should not be influenced, or the internal political a dynamic should not be interfered with. So this is a, a message that they plan or they are sending to uh, people who came from outside to vote or to monitor the elections here in Nigeria. Peter, thank you so much uh, for talking to us. VOS Peter Claude reporting from Lagos, Nigeria. Now, as Saturday's election gets closer, we're bringing you a series of profiles on men and women of all ages and all walks of life in Nigeria. They're talking about what they hope for their country and what they expect from the general elections. Today in the We Are Nigerian series, let's hear from Aisha Jafaru Page. So what we need is a platform where we don't have to travel to China or India to import goods. A platform where you can just order anything you need. I am into selling beds, bed sheets, and carpets. Even though what is contained here are just kitchen utensils. I also deal in designer perfumes, especially Arabian, as well as men, women, and children wears. I would say I am into selling almost anything. The federal government is in the best position to tackle violence by ensuring that security personnel are posted everywhere in order to ensure a free and fair election. We have security personnel at different levels who could be stationed around the country. It is the responsibility of the president and the inspector general of police to ensure the peaceful conduct of the election. We don't like the way the country is being governed because there are no sufficient security measures on ground during elections. We don't know where this problem is coming from. We are therefore calling on the authorities to put adequate security measures on ground to deal with those who sponsor political talks in Kano and other northern states as well as the rest of the country. We have these talks in different states with different names. If I were the president of Nigeria, by the grace of God, the first thing I would do is to improve education, health, and agricultural sectors. I will also build roads that, in order to boost the economy, make provision for potable water because water gives you a healthy society. In the past, we had a lot of confidence in Buhari. 
We used to look at him as a leader who can provide adequate security and fight corruption. But his government has failed to fight corruption. The government is found wanting in that aspect. That is the reason why we bring Atiku, whom we have a lot of confidence on and who has not aged too much. Therefore, he's strong enough and he can rebuild Nigeria. That is why we have high hopes in him. We believe he will carry the youths along, prioritize the issues of security, health, and portable water. Now, Nigerians in New York City are also weighing in on Saturday's election back home. VOA's Adam Phillips spoke with some of them. So I kind of feel that whatever Nigeria gets right now, we would, they would be able to fight through it because I see Nigeria as a country that they fight to win, you know. So no matter how bad it is, whoever comes in, be it Buhari, be it Atuku, they would fight to win. That's what I think about Nigeria at the moment. We've experienced Buhari and we've experienced Atiku. They were good in their right, but their good is not good enough. So I'd say we try somebody else. I'm hoping of uh, free and fair election, but I believe better will happen. Mm -hmm. Trust me, I, I'm not a politician. I'm who I am. Mm -hmm. But I, I believe voting, vote Buhari, vote Atiku, I only pray for uh, the, the best to come because I don't know the best, only God knows the best. I feel that Nigeria needs a younger generation to rule, you know. We have President Buhari coming in, he's been there before, he was a uh, military president, Atiku was a vice president, all these people have been in and out. You know, let's have a change, let's have something else, a younger person come in and rule Nigeria. Let's look at Nigeria in a different light, you know. We can't only concentrate on an aspect of the economy which is um, okay, fight corruption and neglect every other aspect. Did you try with the broker arm? Yes. But do we still have the broker arm? Yes. The fear to live in the north is still a problem everyone faces. Right where they're preaching the corruption is where it, corruption is really happening. I don't know. I don't work with them. I'm not in the inner circle. But from my view, from what I see on TV, I feel like Everything should be tackled more from the inside to get to the outside. You know what I mean? That's what I think about the corruption level in Nigeria. Whosoever that won the election, they should work on the electricity because when the, when you, when the electricity is working, trust me, everything will be easy. New York is just like Lagos, but everything, everything seems to work in New York. How come nothing works in Lagos? But they are practically the same. Everybody is in a rush. The hustle and bustle is practically the same but everything that is dependent on the government seems not to work so where's the problem i think the problem is with the government I, w I would be happy if nigeria could get back to where every you call someone from home and no one is complaining and everyone is saying oh we're doing good the economy is good we can buy food and we're doing well but regardless of all that we're all still praying for nigeria and we believe that there would be a better Nigeria someday, I think pretty soon though. VOS Adam Phillips speaking with Nigerians living in New York about Saturday's presidential election. Now, Sierra Leone's president, Julius Mada Bio, declared last Thursday the prevalence of rape and sexual assault a national emergency, saying those convicted of sexual offenses against minors would face life in prison after months of campaigning by activists. According to police statistics, reported cases of sexual and gender-based violence in Sierra Leone nearly doubled in 2018 to over 8,000, one-third of which involved a minor. Gender-based violence is traditionally seen as a taboo topic in the West African nation. Only 12 years ago, Parliament passed its first gender equality laws in 46 years of independence following lobbying efforts by women's rights groups. Implementation of these policies has been slow and law enforcement agencies have been hampered by inadequate resources, promoting a culture of impunity. In December, uh, First Lady Fatima Bio led a demonstration in Freetown to raise awareness on rape, and she has since launched her Hands Off Our Girls campaign to increase awareness of violence against girls across the region. 
Now for more on this horrific trend in Sierra Leone, I'm joined by Bernadette Kamara, a Sierra Leonean native and founder and president of BK Behavioral Health Center. Bernadette, welcome again to Africa 54. Thank you for having me. This is a sad story to discuss, but we have to talk about it. I'm just wondering, is life in prison for sexual offenders enough to deter this kind of vice? No, actually, it's a start. And I'm happy that the president has declared it a national emergency because it's going to force people to start talking about it. And I'm glad also that the first lady is actually also uh, uh, in the front lines uh, about this uh, problem. But that's just at the beginning. Um, first of all, it should not be just for minors. It should be for everybody. So anybody that raped somebody should be put in prison. Now, I'm just wondering, because in 2012, there was a law that had been passed about sexual offenses, where people who were involved in that or, you know, would get 5 to 15 years. Now, it's life in prison. But I'm wondering, as a behavioral health expert, what kind of conversations ought to be going on within the Sierra Leonean community right now? Well, as we have uh, uh, in my, one of my disciplines, ABA, we said learning is a permanent change in behavior. So what we have to do is educate our people. The women have to know that it is OK to bring up these uh, topics. So if they're raped, they don't suffer in silence, as it has been uh, um, in our culture for many years. So remember that this, this is not the first time this is happening. It's always happening. It's only that now we have uh, ways in which these um, um, atrocities are reported. So what we need to do is to have a good educational program in which we can educate our people, men and women, to understand what the effect of this uh, um, um, uh, crime is. So for example, you have a, a, a man raping a woman. They never go back and ask the girl or try to find out what's happening in the life of that girl. And the sad part here, we have a, a very young victim that was raped by an uncle. Yeah. I mean, how, where does a, a kid like that get a voice? to say this has happened to me. I mean, what kind of counseling, when we say let them speak up, you know, speak up about what has happened to them, who is going to be the voice of reason well, here? We, who is going to be the voice of a victim? We start with the parents. Mm -hmm. We start with our elders. We start with teaching our people to understand what the effects of rape are. Growing up um, in Africa, we have seen it, and as we've seen, because this is a global problem, it's not just an African problem, but we have seen the culture of being silenced. When a woman um, says, I'm raped, in fact, she's victimized even more so. When a child comes home and says, Mom, uh, uncle touched me a certain place, she's slapped and sent to go sit down somewhere and be quiet. So until we start changing those behaviors, until we start saying, OK, when my daughter comes to me and say, I don't want to go to uncle's house, I want to stay at home, mommy. Mom start listening and making sure that that uncle don't come close to my daughter next time. That's not going to stop because most of the perpetrators of these crimes, they are family members. They are uh, uh, either in the family or family friends, people that are well respected in the community and that uh, a child can never even raise their voice against. So when we start understanding that when you rape a five-year-old, maybe you have that five minutes time with that girl, but that girl has to suffer for the rest of her life for that five minutes that you've taken from her life. Bernadette. When we start understanding the effects of that, I think then we start taking it more seriously. Well, Bernadette, this is a topic that we need to have you come back here to yes. discuss further. And counseling services obviously are helpful. Speaking yeah. up is helpful. Yes. We wish the best for all those who are victims, and we hope that this will stop, because it's not only in Sierra Leone, yeah, like you it's said. It's everywhere. It's, it's everywhere. everywhere. It's a global problem, and I, I really hope that our leaders start taking um, the necessary step in educating and providing mental health services for our people. And mm -hmm. when I talk about mental health, I'm not talking about when we talk about mental health, people thinking we're talking about crazy people. Mm -hmm. We're talking about each one of us yes. in the way we behave Bernadette, with our people. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Bernadette Kamara is a native of Sierra Leone and a founder and president of BK Behavioral Health Center. We want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our show live on Facebook. So check us out and share our show with your friends. Still ahead on Africa 54. Another day, another use for 3D printing. We'll be right back.
voices. We're talking about the news and issues you're talking about. Sharing stories of development and growth across Africa, around the world, and in our lives. Topics that inform, empower, and change the rules. It's time for Our Voices with me, Heidi Adams Fitzpatrick. And Hadiza Kiari. And Ayan Bior. And Orion Itangi Shaka. It's time for Our Voices. U.S. President Donald Trump is calling for the resignation of Democratic freshman Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, although she has apologized for comments deemed anti-Semitic and condemned by both Democrats and Republicans. President Trump says Omar should at least resign from the House Foreign Affairs Committee. What she said is so deep-seated in her heart that her lame apology, and that's what it was, it was lame, and she didn't mean a word of it, uh, was just not appropriate. I think she should resign from Congress, frankly. But at a minimum, she shouldn't be on committees, or certainly that committee. Congresswoman Omar is a new lawmaker from Midwestern state of Minnesota, who sent out several tweets Sunday that said a pro-Israel lobbying group in the United States, the American-Israel Public Affairs Committee, is buying off lawmakers to support the Jewish state. Omar is a proponent of the BDS, Movement Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions to Pressure Israel over its treatment of Palestinians and has, with, has drawn attacks for her comments about Israel. U.S. Senator Amy Klobuchar of Minnesota and Elizabeth Warren of Massachusetts are the latest Democrats to formally join the 2020 race for the White House. So far, nine Democrats have either officially declared their candidacy or formed a presidential exploratory committee, and several more are expected to join the crowded field in the weeks ahead. VOA national correspondent Jim Malone reports from Washington. I stand before you to announce my candidacy for President of the United States. Among the latest Democratic contenders is Minnesota Senator Amy Klobuchar, who hopes to build a base of support in the Midwest. I don't have a political machine. I don't come from money. But what I do have is this. I have grit. <laughs> Also officially in the race now is Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren. Warren wants to bridge the economic divide in the country. This is the fight of our lives. The fight to build an America where dreams are possible, an America that works for everyone. Another early contender is New Jersey Senator Cory Booker already busy on the campaign trail in Iowa and promising to heal national divisions. Pull us together across party lines, racial lines against divisions and make sure that this nation again rises. Thank you. I'm going to run for president of the United States. The Democratic field includes several women and minority candidates and is already shaping up as one of the most varied in history says analyst Elaine Kmart. A lot of diversity in the field, which reflects what the Democratic Party is today. Um, it's a pretty good field. I don't know who will manage to rise above the others, but so far it's a pretty solid field. Most of the Democratic contenders hold liberal views on the economy, the environment, and social issues. And with so many new faces in the race, the candidates will be looking to set themselves apart early says John Fortier. I think the, the key candidates, the ones that do well, will have a, have a constituency uh, either in the uh, progressive wing of the party that is really fighting Donald Trump or especially in the African-American community. The candidate field may be diverse, but Democratic voters are likely focused on one unifying goal, says Larry Sabato. When you get right down to it, what's the most important thing to Democrats? If I'm to believe what I'm hearing, and I do, it's that they want to pick the candidate who has the best chance of beating Donald Trump. America is winning again. Isn't that nice? For his part, 
President Trump is eager to bash the Democratic presidential field as too far to the left, as he did at Monday's rally in Texas. Because the Democrat Party has never been more outside of the mainstream. They're becoming the party of socialism, late-term abortion, open borders, and crime. More Democrats are expected to join the race soon, and the list could include former Vice President Joe Biden, 2016 contender and Senator Bernie Sanders, and former Texas Congressman Beto O'Rourke. The country's counting on us. Let's do it. Jim Malone, VOA News, Washington. And welcome back to Africa 54. Here's what's trending. Scientists at a British university are creating technology they say could one day allow people to print their own pills. The University of Sussex is developing a handheld 3D printer, which they say will allow patients to print what they are calling pot pill medicines on demand. The handheld printer takes 30 to 60 seconds to begin each printing process. The medicines could be orally dissolvable, eliminating the need for clean water. They could be used in developing countries and in harsh environments. Next up, thousands of self-proclaimed geeks and tech nerds flocked to Brazil's massive campus party in Sao Paulo this week to show off their fancy desktop computers and debate the future of the internet and other technologies. Campus party is an opportunity for tech enthusiasts to meet in person and share ideas and knowledge they usually only discuss on social networks. A huge section of the event's pavilion is reserved for camping tents where most participants sleep during the week. Campus party started in 1997 in Spain as an event for internet enthusiasts and became the trendsetter for many disciplines such as robotics and software creation. And finally, the latest food trend in Israel isn't an ingredient for or even a recipe. It's a color, black. From black garlic to black cakes, black risotto to black tempura shrimps, hundreds of food fans are attending Tel Aviv's first ever black food festival. Organizers say it's not just about using food colorings, but also unique uses of black coffee, dark chocolate, and sweet and sour balsamic vinegar. It's the brainchild of Hungarian food blogger Regina Boris who says she noticed a trend for colored food on social media. The judges were wowed by an entry from Jaffa-based Ethiopian restaurant Balinjera that offered up injera served with vegetable-based fillings, and that's what's trending today. And that's our show for today. Good night from Washington.